Well, I hope everybody slept well. Did you sleep well? This is going to be a good day. Again, we're continuing to build and build and build, and we're almost right on track. We are a little bit behind, but we will catch up. We design things like an accordion, so we contract and expand. Does anybody have any questions from yesterday or the day before? Anything unclear? Sometimes people say, what, it, what do I do to put all this stuff to work? There's so many different ideas and concepts here. And uh, the answer is very, very simple. Just pick the most important goal in your life and just begin to work on it every day. Write down your goals every morning in a spiral notebook and then just think about your goals and work on your one goal every day. Work on your highest priority every day. Use the law of three. What's the most important thing I can do to achieve my most important goal? With regard to skills, one of the things I encourage people to do is to say, what is the most important skill that I can develop to help me achieve my most important goal? And so work simultaneously. Work on the goal, work on the skill. One of the things that I have found is that the key to success is to do something every day on your most important goal. Do something every day. One sometimes we teach is get, take action, take the first step, and then do something every day. I had a gentleman come to my seminar in uh, Minneapolis. And I've been going back there giving two seminars every year for 14 years. And there's a seminar in the afternoon for business people, managers, business owners, and a seminar in the evening for the members of this organization, most of whom are salespeople and small business people. And he's, people come back every year because I, I design a new seminar every year. And so they come back year after year. Anyway, this gentleman came up to me the last time I did this seminar, and uh, he was very confident, a little bit shy, but confident, and he came up to me and he said, you know, I came to your seminar about 10 years ago. He said, when I'd just gotten out of high school and I was working for a farm equipment dealer in this small town. I was raised on a farm and I uh, went to a local high school, local school, and I was working for this farm implements dealer. And one of your salespeople came through and sold him a ticket for me to go to your sales and personal development seminar. It was a one-day seminar at that time. So uh, my boss bought the ticket and gave it to me and said I could go, take the day off. So he came to the seminar. He said, and I'd never been, in, very seldom come to the big city. He said, I'm from a farm boy from a small town. And he was wearing boots and he was wearing one of those big jackets that they wear. It was wintertime and jeans. And he felt really out of sorts because everybody else was wearing business clothes. And it's right in the middle of the, uh, Minneapolis, at the Minneapolis uh, Convention Center. Beautiful, dressed up well and everything else. So he kind of sat in the back, and it was a bit uncomfortable, but he sort of got into the whole idea of what I was talking about, that you could be and do and have more. And then he said, then you, then you explain that goal setting process. He said, I'd never heard about goals before. He said, so I wrote down 10 goals, he said. And he said, that changed my life. He said, I went back and I was a completely different person. He said, so I was brought up on that farm, and my parents had that farm, my grandparents had that farm. He said, I was working for a farm implements dealer. He said, now, today, he said, I own that farm implements dealership. I own half the bank. I sit on the school board, he said, and on the city council. They want me to run for Congress. He said, I own the farm that I grew up on, on the farm, and the farms on all three sides, he said. And he said, and I attribute it to two things. First of all, writing it down as a goal, he said, and the most important thing was doing something every day. He said, I can tell you with great pride that for 11 years, 365 days a year, sick or well, hot or cold, I have done something every single day without fail on one of my major goals. He said, and that has been the most powerful thing in my life. He said, I've gone far beyond anything my family ever dreamed about. I am now one of the most respected people in the whole area. Um, and it's because I did something every single day. So you ask me, what can you do to really get cranked up and get going? Just do something every day on your major goal. And what happens is you develop a principle called the momentum principle. The momentum principle of success says it's very hard to get going. Remember I've said several times, taking that first step is the hardest thing of all. We resolve to do it. Many people will buy Shalene's program and uh, they'll take it and they'll put it there and say, by gum, there it is, I'm going to use it. That's the one. Uh, and tomorrow morning, maybe, no, Saturday. I've got, I've got to get it. You know, and so it sits there and they don't do it. You know, what is the primary use of um, uh, treadmills in America today. Can you imagine? 
dry, yeah, <laughs> dry that laundry, hanging clothes. Because people buy it and they say, there it is, yes, yes. They think if they walk past it by osmosis, it's going to make them fitter or, or more successful. So it's getting started and, and, uh, and it's keeping, keeping, keeping started. Orison Sweat Marden, who was one of the great pioneers of success, founded Success Magazine, wrote books. They say his book, Pushing to the Front, written in 1895, incredible story, brought America into the 20th century and made America a superpower. Every leading American read Pushing to the Front, huge book. And I bought a copy of it from a used bookstore because it's been out of print for decades. And I was going through it and I found, I was living in, in, uh, in Alberta at the time, and I found that it had been owned by a man named, named Preston Manning. Preston Manning was the, one of the earliest prime ministers or premiers of Alberta who had fought against tremendous political controversy and, and competition and became one of the leading political lights in Canada. And it was his book. And it had all his annotations in the side. Perseverance, determination, creativity, uh, cooperation with other people. And it was just, it was his Bible. And that was around the turn of the century, first few decades of the century. It turned out that many people had had the same thing. Well, Orson Sweat Martin was once asked if he could summarize the reasons for success. And he said he could summarize it in two words. One is get to itiveness, and the second is stick to itiveness. This is get going and keep going. And those are the two keys to success is get going, take the first step, Journey of a Thousand Leagues by Confucius, and then keep going and do something every day. And if you do that, you develop momentum. And here's what we have found with the momentum principle is that a body in motion tends to remain in motion. So once you're in motion, it's easy to keep going. If you stop, Cold and stop doing it for any period of time, it's very hard to get up and get going again. But if you just keep the plate spinning every day, just keep going, just keep doing a little bit, read a little bit, practice a little bit, fo focus a little bit, do a little bit of work on your goal, you just keep going and it becomes easier and easier. Now here's one last principle. We talk about self-esteem. In self-esteem, we say that people want to, be, to feel like winners. When you feel like a winner, your self-esteem goes up. So the question is, how do you get the winning feeling? How do you get the winning feeling? And the answer is, be, by what? By, by winning, yes. In other words, now in a race, in a race, if you win and you come across the finish line first, you're the winner. Okay, you get the, high, get the highest prize. So how do you get the winning feeling? Well, you win. How do you win? You set up benchmarks that enable you to be winning all the time. In other words, you create a world where, where you're winning and what you do is you have small wins as well as big wins. For example, when you're climbing a mountain, I used to be very aggressive at climbing mountains. The first win is to get to the first bridge, and the second win is to get to the next valley, and the third win is to get halfway up the mountain. The final win is when you finally get to the top. The big win is when you get back down to the car. <laughs> Anybody you know what I'm talking about? Oh, that's the win. Uh, anyway, so what you do is you set up a whole series of benchmarks, and what we find is that every time you start and complete a task, you feel like a little winner. And if you start to complete another task, if you say, I'm going to read one chapter, I'm going to do one workout, I'm going to make five calls, you actually set up a whole series of little finish lines. And each time you fit, cover across a little finish line, you get a jolt of endorphin, which makes you feel like a winner and raises your self-esteem and makes you feel happy and positive about yourself. Are you ready to go? Uh, you'll notice that there are exercises after every session. There's a basic rule in accelerated learning, and it's basically review. Is re repetition is the mother of learning. So what I'd like you to do at the end of this conference, within 24 hours, go through and just page through the workbook. It'll take you not more than 10 or 15 minutes, but you'll be astonished, astonished at how many ideas will come to you in that process. And second of all, complete the exercises that we have not had time to do here together. Just go through and complete the exercise. Just, they're just questions, just answer the questions, and it will double the value of what you get from this program. And so the rule is review within 24 hours, review within seven days, review within 30 days, review within three months, review in six months. If you'll do that, 24 hours, seven days, one month, three months, six months, you'll have basically memorized this entire course. You'll actually be good enough to get up and give it. And we've had facilitators giving this course uh, in, in its earliest version, all over the country, all over the world, 150 of them, just in the uh, Western European and Japan, uh, and we have now more than 300 in China, and what they do is they almost memorize the course by simply reviewing it six times, spaced repetition. 
So it's just so do that. Don't take it home and put it on your desk. Take it, just page through it. And I promise you, as you page through it, you, you'll just get so much enjoyment from this. Okay, moving right along, I, we, we want to talk about the mind-body relationship. We know that stress and tension are manifestations of something being wrong with our views of the world. As we say in the introduction here, there's no stress or tension contained in an event or circumstance itself. It is the way we interpret it that causes the stress and tension. So that's why Buddha says that the key to calmness is detachment. It's almost like pulling the plug out so there's no emotional charge to the event. You detach, you pull away from the event so that you remain calm. And when you remain calm, it doesn't mean that you don't care. It just means that all of your highest mental abilities are available to you to solve the problem. So the key point about stress and tension is that they come from within, not from without. Uh, the natural tendency for us when we're young is because our parents get mad at us when we do something, then we automatically get mad at somebody else when they do or not do something. So whenever something goes wrong, we immediately say, who did it? Now, there's nothing that makes you madder than to hit your own thumb with a hammer. You know, and because there's nobody to blame it on. How can you blame it? So what you, you do is you get mad at the hammer. <laughs> Damn hammer. Uh, and you get mad at the hammer. There are people who kick their cars. There are people who you know, kick their lawnmowers. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I learned many years ago is never get mad at a thing. Never get mad at a thing. Never get mad at a computer program that doesn't work. Don't get mad at a, at a utensil that doesn't work. Never get mad at a thing. It's amazing how many people get mad at things. There was a story uh, when, when da da Darius of Persia was marching on um, the, the city of, um, uh, um, not Baghdad, um, when they, he's, he's marching his armies on the great city, uh, I'll come to me in a second, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, on Babylon, and he's marching his armies down, and it was springtime, and he had gotten his armies together, but there was, had been a huge runoff of water, and the Tigris River was, was full to the brim, and he couldn't get his armies across, and he got furious with that river. He got mad at the river, and he had his men and his engineers go up the river, 10, 25 miles, and, and dig tributaries, like canals that would drain off parts of the river so that the water would drain off and flood, and that the level of the river would go down. And he spent something like three months, he was so mad at that river, he had his whole army was out there digging these canals to drain off the river, so the river was finally low enough so he could march across. And uh, as a result, his army was exhausted. The enemy had chance to reinforce and to be prepared and everything else. But it's one of the great examples of history of one of the most powerful of all leaders getting furious at a thing, a river, <laughs> and, and getting mad at that and doing everything possible to punish the river for having been full at, through the banks when he came along. So I passed that along. Never get mad at a thing. Don't get mad at a pen. Don't get mad at a, at a dish that you cook. Don't get mad at a utensil or anything else. Uh, because that just causes you, causes you to be frustrated. So we say there's no such thing as a stressful situation. There's only a stressful reaction. It's only a stressful reaction. So it's not the situation. It's the way we react to it. And the way we react to it, based on the work at the University of Pennsylvania, is our explanatory style. It's how we explain it to ourselves. In NLP, they call it the way you frame it or the way you reframe it. And you always have control over the content of your conscious mind so you can make a decision to frame or reframe or to explain it to yourself differently. That's why we say, if you say that everything that happens is part of a great conspiracy to make you successful and happy, then no matter what happens, especially a setback, you say, oh, wow, this is great. I wonder what it is. It's almost like there's a gift hidden in the setback or problem. And you go looking for the gift, like kids on a scavenger hunt or on Halloween. And that whole attitude transforms what you will find, transforms how you feel. The event is the same, but the way you respond to it is completely different. And you decide the emotional component of the event by the way you choose to think about what happened. So there are three major sources of stress. And by the way, we are all guilty of these probably every single day. Number one, what might have been. We're worried about what might have been. The, remember we talked about if only if only, if only, being the starting point of the explanation of most people's unhappiness. If only he, if only she, if only I, if only they, if only, if only, if only. And so we wipe out if onlys from our lives. We never get upset about what happened in the past. 40% of the things that happened, or is it 
of the things that happen are past events that we cannot change. So never get upset about something you can't change. You just take a deep breath and let it go. Just let it go. Number two is what should be. This is another form of stress. What should be today? People say, well, the room is too cold. Yes, it is. I want you to be wide awake. All right? If you're, if you're too cold, rub your hands together. One of the fastest ways to warm up your whole body is to rub your hands together vigorously. It warms up your whole body. So if you want to and do it under the table, we don't want to see you doing it. Probably. <laughs> In other words, what, what should be? What, it, it, it's, it's interesting. Almost all negative emotions come from frustrated expectations. We're frustrated because we think it should be a certain way, and it's not. But it's interesting. Should is a subjunctive. And a, a subjunctive is something that's completely subjective. In other words, it's a personal opinion. I think it should be this way. Well, that's your own opinion. That's what it is. It's your opinion. It's not reality. It's just your opinion. If you say that the gravity falling objects gather speed at 32 feet a second, that's a fact. But a subjunctive, things should be this way or should be that way. So if you convince that things should be in a certain way and they're not, you'll become angry, you'll become frustrated, you'll want to lash out, it'll cause you stress, tension, denial, it'll cause you depression, uh, fatigue, a whole bunch of things if things don't happen the way you think they should happen. And so be, be very careful about that. Do I have a, a, an unrealistic expectation here? Maybe I expected things to be well. I remember a great story about this little girl, born in a family, uh, three other children, and she's a very nice little girl, and she grows up, but she never speaks, and she doesn't speak. And they take her to pathologists and audiologists, and they test her hearing, and they test everything, and three years, four years, five years, six years, seven years, she never speaks. She's quite cheerful and friendly, and, and, but she never speaks, and they can't find out. And it's kind of like the family tragedy. They have this beautiful little girl that never speaks. And, one day, it's, it's uh, Saturday morning, and they're all having breakfast together, and they're having porridge. They made oatmeal for the family. They're having porridge, and they serve oatmeal. And she takes a bite of her oatmeal, and she's, damn, that's hot! <laughs> and the whole family goes, oh my god, you spoke. You spoke. You spoke. And they all say, she spoke. She spoke. This has been the major issue. In the, she spoke. She said, what, what? She said well, of course I spoke. Well, well, why haven't you spoken before? She said, well, up to now, everything's been all right. <laughs> I always think, well, up to now, everything's been all right. In other words, she had, she's been fine for her, so she had no reason to speak. Anyway, let's go on. Um, number three, what might happen? This is another major source of stress, anticipation of what might happen. And as you know, most of the things that we worry about, 96%, either never to happen, or they're petty, or they're out of our control. So that's why the old idea of having a worry box. And if you have something to worry about, write it down, put it in a worry box, put it aside every Saturday morning when you've gotten up, got a good night's sleep, had a nice cup of coffee, take out your worry box and worry for an hour. You know, and you'll find that 96% of the things you put in the worry box have all been resolved themselves, or they're not even important anymore. So number three is there are three major sources of energy. This is one of uh, the great uh, insights that I got from thousands of hours of study that you'll never see anywhere else. The first is food and water, which we all know about, is we get energy from good quality food and lots of water. We all know today how important hydration is. The more water you drink, the better it is for your body. The more energy you have, the more you detoxify, the more you get all the negative <laughs> stuff out of your body. The second is air. And when uh, Shalene and other people talk about uh, exercise, they're talking about aerobic exercise. And the research on aerobic exercise now is overwhelming. There was a book called Brain Rules that came, Brain Rules, the rules for the brain that came out about two or three years ago. And they're talking about the things that you can do to dramatically improve the functioning of your brain. Number one, first chapter, top of the list is aerobic exercise. Because when you do aerobic exercise for, t for 30 minutes or more, it pumps highly oxygenated blood into your brain. Because when you're breathing, you're oxygenating yourself, and the blood goes to your brain. And people who engage in aerobic exercise, even if it's on a treadmill or bike or swimming, uh, are much brighter, much sharper, much clearer. M their mind works much faster all day long if you exercise first thing in the morning. And eventually, you develop what is called a positive addiction. Because after 30 minutes of exercise, you get the exercise effect, and you feel really good about yourself. And you feel good all day. You just sail all day long. So aerobic exercise, getting lots of air. You've also heard about deep breathing, meditative breathing, breathing through the diaphragm. One of the great 
success principles for any event of importance is to breathe deeply seven times before you go into an event. If I'm going to be giving a talk, like I've given several talks in the last few weeks to 14 to 20, 24,000 people, it's like speaking to the ocean. And even as a professional speaker, you do just a little, get a little tiny bit tense before you speak to this many people. And you have exactly 20 minutes. And then the trap door falls out from under you. Uh, and so you have to get on, open, develop, and close within 20 minutes. And your clients are watching like this. And you better not go over. Because if you go over, you're going to be in big trouble. And you better do a great job. You better get standing ovations or they won't have you back. Hey, no pressure here, huh? <laughs> so what you do is you just go. Deep, breathe as deep as you can. Seven times. Seven deep breaths drop you into alpha temporarily, calm you completely, like water going calm. And then when you go in to perform, your whole brain is functioning at a higher level. So whenever you're thinking of some event, or you're getting ready to go, or you're getting ready for a meeting or a sales call, just stop and breathe deeply seven times. Do it in your car. Do it in the parking lot. Nobody can see you. I mean, you can, nobody knows that you're breathing deeply. I'll stand behind the stage as they're doing the introduction, breathing deeply and letting it out. And what happens is you then go out and you function. You perform far better. You're far more calm. You're smoother. Just give it a try. So breathing is a major source of energy. And the third major source of energy is impressions. And this is the great breakthrough. This comes back to some of the metaphysical work done at the turn of the last century by Uspensky and Gurdjieff is that impressions, things that we perceive, have an effect on our energy. And an impression can be a piece of information. You can, could phone home or get a call on your phone, which you didn't turn off. You just put it on stun, so we know you still got your phone on you. Uh, you could get a call and find out that there, your house has burned down, or somebody has been hurt, or there's been a tragedy, and it totally changed your energy. It'll cause you to be angry, it'll cause you to be depressed, it'll cause you to be distracted. One impression, one sentence. Oh my God, I'm glad you called because such and such has just happened. Wham. Or maybe it can be something else. I'm glad you called. You just won the lottery. They called from the lottery office. You've won the lottery. You are rich beyond belief for the rest of your life. It's a, that, that Powerball, $256 million, and the press are all over the place. They want to know what you're going to do with the money. Well, you would be so energized, you would just literally come off the chair. I mean, you would run to the bathroom. You, you would be so excited because of something like that. So one impression can have an enormous impact on your energy. That's why it's so important when we talked about the suggestibility of, that we have is to keep feeding our minds with positive impressions, positive conversations, positive reading, positive audio programs, and positive people, just positive things so the impressions keep us up and positive and clear. So this is really important. Those are the three things that you can change. You can change the impressions, and one of the impressions is, is the interpretation of an event. Changing the interpretation of event dramatically changes your energy and your ability to function well. If you, if you translate an event so it makes you really angry, your ability to function drops through the floor. You can't think straight. You can't listen clearly. You can't sleep well. You can't talk. You can't, you can't function well when you're in the grip of a negative emotion. So there are, three, there are four forms of energy. This is a, something else that you'll never see anywhere. There are people who have, actually, I, I was listening to a speaker on a CD who was trying to explain these four forms of energy, which he got from my program, and he did a terrible job of it because he just did not do the reading. He did not, that, did not understand the principles behind it. The four forms of energy are this. First of all, there's physical energy. Now, I want you to think of energy uh, as having different stages of refinement and the best example I can use is the stages of refinement of crude oil. So imagine that physical energy is the energy with which you do physical work. You sweat, and you pick up things, and you lift, and you move things. And this requires crude energy, which is food, meat and potatoes, good solid meal. If you're going to go out and work all day, you've got to be well nourished. You've got to fill your physical tank with good food. So in a refinery, an oil refinery, they bring in crude oil. And let's say it takes 1,000 barrels of crude oil to come into that factory before it begins being refined. So if you work in a field where you do not use all of your physical energy during the day, then some of it is left over, and it's refined to a higher level. The next higher level is emotional energy. So let us say it takes 1,000 units of physical energy to generate, to refine, 
to 100 units of emotional energy. Now, emotional energy is the energy with which you feel, with which you express emotions, with which you love, with which you laugh, with, uh, with, with you, which you um, uh, hate and get angry and so on. Emotional energy is a form of energy. And if you use all of your energy at the physical level, so at the end of the day, you're exhausted physically, notice you can't even make emotional decisions. You know, what would you like to do? You just, you know, I don't care. Uh, well, let's do anything. What do you want to eat? I don't care. You know, you just, in other words, because all of your physical energy is gone, you have no energy for higher purposes. So emotional energy re requires that you conserve energy at the lower level. The next type of energy is mental energy. Mental energy is the energy with which you think and decide clearly, with which you analyze and compare and decide. It's the energy with which you learn. It's the energy with which you uh, make decisions. It's the energy with which you do business. Mental energy is only possible if you do not burn up all your energy at the physical and emotional levels. Now, how do we burn up our energy at the emotional level? The answer is by the expression of negative emotions. Now, here's the rule. Positive emotions empower you and give you energy, positive impressions. Negative emotions disempower you and fatigue you. They say that one eight-minute expression of anger or negative emotions can burn up all your emotional energy for 24 hours. Sometimes you can get so angry, they say people are shaking with anger. You've heard that, shaking with... What that means is they have burned up so much energy at that level, they've burned up all the glucose in their system. And it takes a while for the liver to release more, more sugar to get the system stabilized again. But after that period of angry expression of negative emotions, they're drained. They're, sometimes they're just exhausted because by, when, you use your negative, when you use your emotional energy to express negative emotions, it drains you. Now, here's another example. You come home after a really um, hard day, and you've had a lot of stress that day, and the person's there said, what do you want to do for dinner? And you say, I can't decide. What do you want to watch? I can't decide. In other words, you're, you're burned out emotionally, so you have no mental energy left. You can't even make a decision. Have you had this experience? We have it all the time. Now, the highest energy of all is called psychic energy. This is called the energy of creation. So it takes you 1,000 units of physical energy, refined to generate 100 units of emotional energy, refined to generate 10 units of mental energy, refined to develop one unit of psychic energy or creative energy. It is psychic energy with which you create, with which you use the superconscious mind, with which you have ideas, with which you write, with which you make plans. It's the psychic energy of creation that is the key to the, your future. And the only way you can have higher levels of energy, mental and psychic, is by avoiding the depletion of your energy at the lower levels through the expression of negative emotions. And this was the great insight for me is that it is not negative emotions, it is the expression of negative emotions to yourself, where you're talking about the things that you're mad at over and over, or expressing them to other people. In either case, they burn up all of your energy and make you incapable of thinking very clearly and make you incapable of creating goals, plans, ideas for your life. So always think about that. Is the, the, key is, the key, and we'll talk about this, the expression of negative emotions burns up your energy at lower levels so that you do not have enough energy at higher levels with which to fulfill your potential. Expression of negative emotion burns up your energy at lower levels so you don't have enough energy at higher levels with which to fulfill your potential. And you can go back to our graph here and you could say that physical, let, let us say that um, the, the physical energy is crude oil, emotional energy is gasoline, uh, mental energy is um, uh, refined uh, oil, like kerosene, and psychic energy is like nitroglycerin. I'm sorry, to my mental energy would be like a lighter fluid, uh, which, takes a, which is a much more refined petroleum product, and the highest form of petroleum product will be nitroglycerin. So what will happen is it may take 1,000 units of physical energy to get one uh, unit of nitroglycerin or psychic energy. And so the key to success in life is to conserve energy at lower levels so that you can have the energy available to use at higher levels. People who are negative or angry all the time never accomplish anything because they never have any mental or psychic energy, which are the higher forms of energy 
that make a great life possible. And for your superconscious mind to work, you have to store up energy at higher levels. That's why sometimes if you'll take a really good night's sleep and get up and sit quietly with a cup of coffee in the morning, you'll be astonished at the ideas that will come to you and the problems that will be solved and the insights that you'll have because now you're rested all the way up and you have these reserves of higher forms of energy that make all of life possible. So we say the solution to achieving higher levels of energy, happiness, and inner peace is to eliminate the expression of negative emotions. Eliminate the expression of negative emotions. And what people do, remember we talked about justification, identification, rationalization. When a person has a negative experience, they start to think of all the reasons why they're entitled to be negative. So what, you do, what they're doing is they're taking their fabulous brain and they're using it against themselves. So what you have to do is to eliminate negative emotions, use the law of substitution, and you find reasons not to express negative emotions. You find reasons not to express. If you have a friend who is having a problem, you can say, well, you know something, if you look for the good in every situation, you'll always find something good. So what could be good in this situation? Once the person switches the focus point from the problem and the person to looking for something good in the situation, their mind goes instantly from black to white and goes instantly from negative to positive. So what you're doing is you're helping them stop the expression and rumination over the negative event and think about what something that's good is something that's good in this situation. And when you ask, when you say that in every single difficulty or setback, there's a gift in the form of a lesson, I wonder what you're meant to learn from this situation. And so if you look for the lesson and keep your mind off the negative thing, what happens is you'll always find a lesson and by the law of substitution, you'll be positive and the expression of negative emotions stops. So the great business of life is to eliminate the expression of negative emotions. If you can do that, you can conquer the world. If you can do that, you can have all the love and joy and fulfillment and happiness that you want in your life if you can eliminate the expression of negative emotions. And you do this by finding reasons not to express rather than thinking of all the reasons why you're entitled to express negative emotions. One of the simplest of all is simply the words, I am responsible. The words, I am responsible, are so powerful, they're scary because they immediately stop all expression of negative emotions. And if you keep saying, I am responsible, I am responsible, every time you think about it, I am responsible, eventually, the negative emotion goes lower and lower like a fire that has no more fuel and eventually dies out. And then, as I said yesterday, when you think of the event, it has no negative emotion attached to it. It has no electrical charge. You think of the person, you think of the event, almost like it was happening to someone that you don't know or something you read about. And all the negative emotion that was charged with are gone. And if there is negative emotion, just say, wait a minute, I'm responsible. God bless them, let them go. God bless them, God bless her, let her go. Just, want, just let it go. Wish them well. You, you cannot bless a person and wish them well and still be mad at them. Now, people say, but I don't want to let that bastard off the hook. Well, the bastard's not on the hook. Somebody's on the hook, but it's not the other person. Who is it? <laughs> so what you do is you're keeping yourself on the hook. Can you imagine anything dumber than that? So say, I God bless them and let it go. God, I God bless them and wish them well. I bless them and wish them well. Bless them and wish them well. I'm responsible. I bless them and wish them well. And you keep saying that until it almost becomes automatic. Whenever you have a problem in life with another person, you say, God bless them. I wish them well. And I let them go. I'm responsible. I got myself into it. At least I'm responsible for my actions, my responses. And I'm not going to be angry. I just refuse to get upset about it. Just be cheerful until it becomes a habit. Uh, so understanding the mind-body relationship, remember the law of habit. In the absence of some external influence, we will go on acting the same way indefinitely. And the external influence is a decision that I am, I am going to let this situation or person go. And once you let them go, then you stick to it. Remember the law of expression. Whatever is impressed is expressed. So if you allow the negative experience to impress you, you take it in and you become angry about it, it's going to be expressed in your life. It's going to be expressed in the, your, your, your relationships. It's going to be expressed in your conversation. Remember it with Sigmund Freud, they called it the Freudian slip, is that if you let people speak long enough, what is really bothering them will, will slip out. It'll fall out of their mouths. That's why when you talk to a person, you say, how's it, how's it going? Oh, everything's fine, great, life's great, everything else. 
yeah, well, how, how's, how's your work? Oh, everything's fine. You know, my boss is such a bastard, though. I mean, you know, it just falls out. Ooh, ah, because whatever is impressed, I'm always thinking about how bad my boss is, it's going to pop out. And it's going to preoccupy you. Every one of us has had the experience where we're totally preoccupied with a negative emotion. And we can't think clearly. We drive past our turnoff. Uh, we almost get in car crashes. When we're talking to somebody else, we're looking at them like this, but we're thinking of what we're really mad at them the whole time so we don't hear them when they speak. And they say, well, remember I told you that a few minutes ago? No, you didn't. Yes, I did. I said, no, you didn't. You never said that. Well, they did say it. You just didn't hear it because you were so immersed. Okay, so remember this. So 